Welcome to the Brainy Boomers Lecture Series. We are pleased that you have joined us today. First, we would like to begin by acknowledging that the McGill University Research Center and Studies in Aging is located where our work is done on unceded indigenous lands. The Kanyan Kehaka Nation is recognized as the custodian of the lands and waters on which we gather today. TOTIK, commonly known as Montreal, is historically known as the gathering place for many Indigenous peoples. Today, it continues to be the home to a diverse population of Indigenous and other peoples. We respect the continued connections with the past, present, and future, and our ongoing relationships with Indigenous and other peoples we serve within the Montreal community and at large. Just a little short introduction uh, about our center and welcome everyone today. In 2007, the McGill University Research Center for Studies in Aging Education Committee started the Brainy Boomers Lecture Series to suggest practical steps to both improve and maintain brain health, as well as to promote healthy lifestyle choices amongst the most populous generation in history. The MCSA Education Committee was founded in 1996 and has three objectives. First, identifying education needs of healthcare providers, seniors, caregivers, the public, and developing responses to meet these needs. Two, enhancing responses, um, positive images of the aging process by addressing stereotypes, myths and paradigms about aging, and three, the dissemination of research on successful aging. Um, we would So without further ado, I would like to introduce to you our guest lecture speaker today. Today's guest is Dr. Tan Dang Vu. Thank you for being here, Dr. Vu. Uh, Dr. Dang Vu has received his MD degree in 2004 from the University of Liège, Belgium. This was followed by a specialization in neurology and a PhD in biomedical sciences. He completed his first postdoctoral fellowship at the Department of Neurology at the Massachusetts General Hospital Harvard Medical School um, in Boston and a second postdoctoral fellowship at the Center for Advanced Studies in Sleep Medicine at the Hôpital du Sacré-Cœur in Montréal. He is the recipient of several scientific awards, including from the Canadian Sleep Society, the Sleep Research Society, the European Sleep Research Society, the Belgian Association for Sleep Research and Sleep Medicine, and the Belgian Neurological Society. He is currently full professor and research chair in sleep, neuroimaging, and cognitive health at Concordia University, and is a FRQS senior scholar. Dr. Dang Wu is also a vice president um, research at the Canadian Sleep Society and a member of the Royal Society of Canada's College of New Investigators. He is also a neurologist, researcher, and associate director of clinical research at the Geriatric University Institute of Montreal, as well as an associate professor in the Department of Neuroscience at the University of Montreal. Uh, Dr. Tang Vu's research activities focus on the pathophysiology of sleep disorders and the role of sleep in cognition, utilizing tools such as EEG and brain imaging. To date, he has published over 100 peer-reviewed journal articles and over 30 book chapters. Dr. Dang Vu is on the editorial board of several scientific journals and is an associate editor of the journal Sleep. Before continuing, we would like again to remind you to please mute your microphones and if you have any questions, uh, please write them in the chat Zoom box and we will address them following Dr. Wu's lecture. And for this presentation, if you have an earphone, we would encourage you to use them as well. So without further ado, we invite our special guest today, Dr. Dang Wu to start his lecture. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you very much, uh, Alexandra, for the introduction. So it's a pleasure to be with you today and to discuss about sleep and its importance for brain health. So now I'm going to share my screen and uh, hopefully you'll be able to see it correctly. Is it showing well in full mode display? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to continue then. So uh, yes, today I'm going to discuss about sleep, sleep problems and how they're important to consider if you want to uh, preserve your brain health and what also you can do to uh, uh, make sure that you are taking care of your sleep. All right, so um, 
just before we dive into uh, more of the subjects, I'm just going to give some reminder about what is, how we do measure and define sleep. So um, sleep is actually defined by the succession of different stages uh that we uh spend um our night with and so you can see here on the top figure uh, what we call a hypnogram which is the graphical representation of the different sleep stages through which we go through the night so when we fall asleep we go into what's called non-REM sleep and this non-REM sleep is subdivided into different stages from one to four actually now three uh, but these stages are cons are uh, termed according to the level of depth of sleep. So stage one is very light, stage three is the deep stage of sleep. And you see that these stages are organized into what you call cycles. So cycle is the alternation between different sleep, sleep stages. And it ends usually with a period of what you see in red here, which is REM sleep or rapid eye movement sleep. So REM sleep is a very different stage of sleep, which is the, the stage in which we um, dream the most. So we do dream throughout all stages of sleep, but REM sleep is the one during which our dreams are the most vivid and bizarre and, and, and you know, very rich in terms of content. Uh, and what you can see is that, you know, these cycles of sleep stage succession is repeating itself in the night in such a way that uh, the the nights, the cycles of the beginning of the night contains more deep sleep, stage three sleep. And the, the cycles toward the end of the night contains more REM sleep, the uh, stage in which you dream the most. So this is why usually when you wake up from sleep at the end of the night, in the night you're more likely to remember your dreams than when you wake up right after falling asleep. And this is why people sometimes say that, uh, sorry, um, that the uh, hours of sleep before midnight count double. It's not actually totally true, but it means that the beginning of the night is the one during which you have the most uh, of the most of your deep sleep. So the, the one that is uh, the most restorative. Now, if you look into what is what represent what these the different sleep stage present in terms of uh, proportion. So non-REM sleep, including deep sleep, is about seventy-five percent of your sleep time. And your deep sleep, which we also call N3 sleep, is about 20% of your sleep time. REM sleep is about 20, 25% of your sleep time. Okay, so that's basically in a nutshell how your sleep is organized, or normal night of sleep is organized through the night. So now how how does sleep, how is sleep regulated? I'm not going to give a lot too much of scientific discussion. So this is just an introduction and then of course I'm going to dig into more practical aspects, but this is just to show you that, you know, and maybe it's for you to remember that there are mainly two factors that really drive your sleep and your awakening. Like if we want to really schematically represent this. So we have what is called the uh, sleep drive. In the scientific terms, we call it process S or homeostatic. The sleep drive just means that basically your tendency, your propensity to fall asleep will increase throughout the day with your the amount of hours that you spend awake. That makes sense. So the more time you spend awake, the greater your sleep pressure or your sleep drive is. And this is why when you wake up, your sleep drive is minimum. You just have a night of sleep. And when you arrive at the night, your sleep pressure, your sleep drive is the highest because you've accumulated this uh, the most sleep pressure throughout the day. Okay. This is so why, for example, if you do nap during the day, the sleep pressure will decrease, the sleep drive will decrease to some extent, and your sleep drive throughout the, the end of the day will be lower than if you had uh, stayed awake the full day. That's one thing. The other factor is what they call the process S, or circadian, which means that basically uh, your tendency to fall asleep or to stay awake is also modulated by uh, some what we call a biological clock, which means that there's some system inside the brain that will tell the brain when it's time to, to be awake or to sleep, depending on the hour, the time of the day. And this system is basically entrained by the light, by the environment. The light during the day will stimulate some parts of your brain that will tell your system, well, it's time to wake up. And at night, the same system will not receive light and will tell to your brain while well, it's time to fall asleep. And that's what we call the process S circadian. 
And this basically represents a sort of wake drive. And this wake drive is increasing also during the day, but then decreasing towards the end of the day because uh, of the lack of light. And you see that these two systems basically interact to modulate your tendency to fall asleep or to stay awake. The more time you spend awake, the more time you need, the more pressure you have to fall asleep. And during the day, you have more pressure to stay awake thanks to the circadian system that will inform your brain that you know with the light stimulating your brain, that's the time to, uh, to stay and remain awake. And this would have some implication that I will explain later on. This is why I'm explaining this to you now. Okay, so why is it important to sleep? Uh, and why is it important to take care of your sleep? Well, so there's different reasons. But among the different functions that we know uh, that sleep is important for, we know that there are at least four functions that are facilitated during sleep. Uh, we know, for example, that during sleep, um, your brain seems to be more able to um, basically remove uh, some waste from your brain, basically to ensure that your brain remains in a, in a stable uh, mode. Because when you are during the day, during the night, your brain, like any parts of your body, is producing different um, products, different proteins that need to be eliminated uh, from the body just to maintain a uh, good uh, optimal balance. And we know during, during sleep, the system of cleaning your uh, proteins and your different uh, product, products on the metabolisms is better, uh, is actually facilitated during deep sleep compared to during awake. Uh, that's one thing. The second thing we know that during sleep, we are better able to consolidate memories, which means that we are better able to um, make the information that we learn during the day more uh, strongly uh, strongly encoded into your brain. That what it means is that when you learn new information, you know your information goes through different parts of your brain. Uh, there, there are some parts, for example, one called the hippocampus that is important to encode new memories. But then if you want your memory to become really stable and really, really strongly uh, memorized, you need this information to be stored to other parts of your brain. And this is how sleep and when sleep is actually important because, because sleep is actually facilitating the uh, transfer of information from some parts of your brain to the other parts of your brain when it, where it remains, where it can be uh, stored um, more permanently. So, so long-term memory formation, memory consolidation is another uh, important function of your sleep. Then there are other functions. So sleep is for the brain, but sleep is also for the body. We know that during sleep, we have a variety of hormones that are uh, basically tightly uh, regulated as a function of the sleep-wake cycle, which means that they have they are not uh, produced any time of the day, but produced at certain uh, pattern during the day and night. And, and, and sleep is therefore important to maintain this balance of having your hormones uh, acting in an optimal way. And we know that lack of sleep can lead to different uh, dysregulations in your metabolism. Um, and then lastly, uh, and, and not the least, we also know that sleep is important to strengthen your immune responses. We know that during sleep, there, there is a higher, or well, sleep helps to uh, produce antibodies uh, and cellular responses against infections and so actually produce responses uh, to a vaccine for example so if you sleep you're better able to uh, respond to um, infections to produce a proper immune response so this is this is in a nutshell a summary of why sleep is important there are many other functions or potential functions this is still an area that is researched uh, intensively um, but um, what I also want to mention to you is that important information that you should be aware is that sleep is not something that is static. Obviously, sleep also changes across the lifespan. You know that babies and kids have a large amount of sleep. They sleep a lot. And then your sleep decreases uh, in, uh, in across uh, with age. 
And we know that when we reach the older age, your know, sleep is not, sorry, our sleep architecture is not the same. That prompts my point, I'm sorry. Our sleep architecture is not the same because we know that we have, uh, so that's what you can see here on the graph, the different stages of sleep changes uh, as we age. And the, um, the state that is the most reduced when you age is the stage of N3, the, the deep sleep. Deep sleep is becoming shorter as you age, and that's normal. That's a normal evolution. Uh, and uh, on the contrary, what increases uh, with age is the uh, time that we spend awake after sleep onset. So basically, in other words, uh, when we become older, it is natural. There's a natural evolution to have a sleep that is less deep and to have more awakenings during the night. Okay, It's not that it's becoming a disorder necessarily. It just means that your sleep changes uh, with this less deep sleep and more awakenings during the night. And this has also some repercussions on the number of hours that are supposed to be that Things thought to be needed to uh, for, for per night. Uh, so you see that the number of hours that are recommended of sleep depends on the age range. And when you're an adult, it's usually between seven and nine hours. Uh, and when you're older, it can be more towards seven, eight hours. But you can see that this varies a lot, even within the same age range. Some people may need only six hours, other people may need nine hours. Uh, and this is actually dependent really on every, this should be uh, depending on, on every person's um, profile. And so this is not something that uh, is the same for everyone. That's a very important message because sometimes people think that they, they absolutely need eight hours, but it's actually not true. Uh, some people may need it. On average, that's what is the case. But basically, the important the number of hours that you need is the number of hours of sleep that uh, allows you to feel refreshed during the day without having to take uh, tons of ca caffeine, of course, and without the need to uh, spend a lot of time napping during the day. So that's the amount of hours of sleep that you need. And so, as I said, some people will only need six hours. Uh, some people may need eight hours or even nine hours. That really depends from one person to the other. Okay. So this was for the introduction about uh, some generalities about sleep and sleep definitions, sleep functions. Now I want to delve uh, directly into when sleep becomes a problem, when sleep becomes a disorder. And the most common, basically, uh, the most common disorder of sleep is insomnia, which is defined by difficulties falling asleep or staying asleep. And insomnia is something that is, you know, commonly observed in uh, older individuals because sleep is because sleep is more fragmented uh, when you age. You're more likely to develop insomnia. So, so that you will uh, automatically develop insomnia, or absolutely not. But you're more your sleep is more fragile. So this is a risk factor. Uh, we know that females tend to report more insomnia than males. We know so that when you have the variety of different conditions, medical, psychiatric conditions, you're more likely also to present sleep problems. Um, now we do distinguish between two type of um, insomnia. So people who have acute insomnia, so insomnia for a couple of days, and this will resolve itself. So this is usually during a period of stress for example, versus people having chronic insomnia or insomnia disorder when these problems happen for a long time, more than three months and more than three times a week. And, and then this can become a problem that needs to be treated. And, and becomes it becomes a disorder. Insomnia becomes a disorder when, as I said, you have difficulties falling or staying asleep uh, at least three times a week for at least three months. And importantly, when it leads to a significant disruption of you know, the way that you're able to function during the day. Okay? So that's important because, because our sleep is more fragmented as we age, it is, it is normal to sometimes having, have problems staying, staying asleep during the night, wake up in the night. And if you do have these problems without having the need, having any impact on your function during the day, that's absolutely fine you should not be worried if you're able to uh, still you know uh, be uh, perform your activities social activities physical activities without 
any uh, problems, then it means that you are just experiencing these uh, natural physiological changes of sleep uh, that you that everyone experiences with age. Okay, it's only when you have an impact on your daytime function that you should be considering this to be a problem. And what type of impact does it mean? So some people with insomnia will complain of fatigue. Others will complain of uh, impaired attention, like difficulties uh, concentration. Uh, some negative impact on social, family, or academic life, or professional life. Some mood disruption. Some people will be will feel more depressed. Others more irritable. Some sometimes some people will feel sleepy and so on. Uh, and and in general, a lack of satisfaction about sleep quality. So these are examples of how sleep insomnia may affect your daytime function, and and when it does, it means that you may have an insomnia disorder, and that's frequent like about uh, more than 10% of people in Canada, and, and this is the same across countries, uh, do uh, uh, have uh, some insomnia disorders. So that's one, uh, that's a very common condition. And probably that several of you here on the call may have this problem. So as I said, it's very frequent. Uh, it increases with age. Uh, when you actually, uh, in older people, like uh, one third to uh, up to 40% of older people have some insomnia symptoms. As I said, women are more frequently reporting insomnia than males. And it has a variety of association impacts with other problems. We know that, for example, when you have insomnia, it's more likely that we present problems like with anxiety and depression. And it's not that insomnia causes anxiety and depression, or anxiety and depression causes insomnia. <laughs> it is that those problems are actually interconnected and they are influencing each other. Beyond mental health, we also know that insomnia does affect your physical health, that with insomnia there's a higher association with diabetes, obesity, and different cardiovascular disease, so heart problems, hypertension, stroke. There have been some studies finding association with these medical problems. So insomnia affects your mental health, your physical health, but it also affects your brain health and your memory and your, and your cognitive health. So some studies have shown that when you have insomnia, your performance at different tasks, cognitive tasks is lower, particularly working memory, problem solving, and most importantly, declarative memory. Declarative memory is the memory that you will use when you learn new facts and new information, uh, when you, for example, trying to remember news or when you read a book and trying to, to, uh, to remember what's in the book or what's in the journal. So that's what you have, what you use when you uh, use declarative memory. And so we know that people with insomnia have a lower performance at this memory than, uh, than people without insomnia. And we know that this risk is particularly uh, important in people having insomnia and sleeping less than six hours per night. And there's, there's even some studies that show that there might be an increased risk of developing a disorder like Alzheimer's disease uh, on the long term in people with insomnia disorder. Now, uh, it, it's, it, it's important, so important to realize that it does have some impact on the society and the uh, socio socioeconomic level. So there's been some estimation in you that insomnia costs to, uh, the, to uh, the society like if we take Quebec alone, it costs a couple of billion dollars per year, just in terms of costs of lost productivity, um, for the most part, actually, uh, but also absences, uh, um, uh, healthcare costs, and so on. So this is not a minor problem. Insomnia is a true problem that requires attention. So now, how does insomnia develop over time? Why does people develop insomnia? So as I said, not everyone is uh, equally uh, predisposed to insomnia. Some people have a higher risk than others. So, uh, so these are called predisposing factors. So that, for example, having uh, some depression, anxiety problems, being older, being a woman, uh, is predisposing you uh, to develop insomnia. But usually insomnia develops uh, after some acute event happens. Uh, usually uh, there is a precipitating factor, not always, but sometimes people will report that they start to fall to, to uh, report insomnia after a physical illness, uh, uh, hospitalization, 
but but also can be after any life stressful event. Uh, could be I know could be for example if you had a, a, a separation, a, um, a a change in your job, a uh, some family problems and so on. All these can precipitate insomnia. And now what we that is very important to know is that if even like after this factor, this precipitating factor has disappeared, some people will still continue to develop insomnia over time. And this is sometimes due to the fact that there are some factors that will perpetuate insomnia over time. And this is, for, for example, different um, maladaptive behaviors that people will tend to adopt in response to insomnia. And we know that these behaviors can be actually detrimental sometimes. For example, st staying a long time in bed, uh, napping for a long time during the day, and having this really negative association between the bed and dying and sleep. This sort of conditioning factor can be also something that can perpetuate insomnia over time. Now, why is why are all the people more vulnerable to sleep problems, and particularly insomnia? Uh, there are a variety of factors. There are some physiological factors. We know that as we age, we're more likely to present with other medical problems, other neurological problems, other sleep disorders. And when this is the case, then you're more likely to develop uh, sleep problems like insomnia. We know, as I said, that sleep is more fragmented as you age, uh, and that sleep is also deep, large, more shallow as you age. And uh, something that you should also know is that the uh, circadian clock, this biological clock that helps you time your sleep according to the light day, light dark cycle of the, the day. This clock is also less uh, less functioning as you age. So your the system that aligns your sleep with the night time is also less functioning uh, because of the, the parts of your brain that are controlling that system there are just less. Uh, are less functional as you age. But there are also some non-biological factors. For example, as you age, a lot of people retire. And then when you retire, you have less uh, commitments during the day. And sometimes you may have some uh, more unusual schedules or more free uh, schedules. That, and some people return to uh, sleep later, sleep to, so more easily during the day because they're less active. So this can also be generators of sleep problems on the long term. The fact that uh, some people, not every people, but uh, of course some people, as they age, have a more sedentary lifestyle. Uh, they they stay at home, watch TV, nap, and this can also have uh, an impact on the sleep pressure, the sleep drive that I was mentioning earlier. The fact that you have less activities and irregular sleep schedules can also uh, be a problem for your um, your uh, sleep wake cycle, and also finally, sometimes uh, some older people may live in environments where they have reduced exposure to light, uh, and that's also something that can be problematic to uh, maintain a good sleep wake uh, cycle. Because as I was saying earlier, light during the day is very important to maintain your wake drive and to inform your brain that it's time to stay awake. And if you don't have this stimulus uh, or if this stimulus is not strong enough during the day, you may have more sleepiness during the day. So, uh, well, it's it's nice to see that sleep and insomnia are important to consider, but what can we do about it? And so the good news is that there are some solutions that exist to help uh, people having sleep difficulties have a better sleep. So you probably all know about medications and I'm not going to discuss them today because medications are, usually, are now considered not being the first line treatment when you have sick problems. Medications should only be actually as a second option when uh, the first line option do not work. And when you need to take medication, the over-the-counter ones are usually the worst ones. So you should always consult with your uh, health professional, your physician, to choose which ones is the best and, and for how long. Now, what you can do already on your own is uh, try to follow the strategies that are included in what we call the cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. Because that's the approach that's considered first line when you have sleep difficulties, when you have insomnia. 
why is it considered first line? Uh, that's because it's just uh, it has no side effects and can be uh, and it's uh, and it does um, um, uh, have some long term benefits. So what does it consist of? So CBTI, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, basically is is our is a therapy that will um, help you learn strategies to uh, to target factors that perpetuate insomnia over time. So this sometimes there are some dysfunctional beliefs that can help can perpetuate insomnia over time. Sometimes there's some behaviors that are not adapted. And basically the way it's, uh, it's structured, it consists of several modules, five, six modules that really uh, uh, will focus on the different aspects of your sleep uh, uh, strategies. And this is an intervention that's usually performed in groups, sometimes individually uh, with a psychologist for five, six or to eight sessions. It's not a therapy, like a therapy that's supposed to last for, for years. And these are really, so I'm basically teaching you some, some strategies over five to six sessions. And um, as I said, it's a first time treatment because actually it works in most people, like two thirds of people with insomnia, including insomnia in the older age is actually uh, show benefits from this type of approach. And these effects are long lasting without significant adverse effects. And it can work both in people with uh, insomnia, uh, what you call primary insomnia, which is insomnia without other, other problems, but it can also work in insomnia uh, with depression, insomnia with chronic pain, and even with people with insomnia uh, due to cancer. So we know that regardless of what your insomnia is associated with, usually this approach is, uh, is uh, beneficial. So. CBTI will consist of different modules. One module is sleep hygiene. And that's, that's to make sure that you do have some um, good sleep habits. Uh, and that includes, for example, um, um, uh, having regular sleep schedules, sorry. Having regular sleep schedules. So basically means going to bed at the same time and waking up at the same time, approximately. Um, avoiding uh, caffeinated beverages in the late afternoon and evening. That includes, of course, coffee, but also tea or hot chocolate because these are contain stimulants. Uh, encouraging physical activity during the day. We know that physical activity does improve or facilitate sleep. Uh, and having like, a, it does not have to be something intense or high intensity. It can be something as uh, casual as having at least uh, 30 minutes walk during the day outside if possible. Uh, encouraging social activities during the day, having a balanced diet, avoiding alcohol in the evening because alcohol is actually uh, disrupting your sleep quality. It's, some people think that alcohol is good for sleep because it makes you feel sleepy, but it does actually also disrupt your sleep and make your sleep more uh, fragmented. Uh, the bedroom environment is important to consider, having a quiet, dark, room, uh, having a comfortable mattress, obviously. Naps, if you have sleep difficulties, naps should usually be uh, avoided or limited as much as possible because once you nap, when you nap, you decrease the sleep drive and you make your sleep at night more difficult to obtain. And finally, making sure that you have enough light during the day and that your environment is dark enough at night just to help your magical clock synchronize your sleep with the uh, daylight uh, cycle. That's sleep hygiene. So basically, you know, making sure there's nothing that you do that prevents you from falling asleep at night. Secondly, relaxation techniques can be something that can help some people. It's not something that is man mandatory in the CBTI approach, but basically it is, you see, there are some um, strategies that allow you to feel more relaxed as you approach bedtime. So this could be like, you know, yoga, but this can be uh, as casual as, you know, trying to do some uh, some some relaxing activities like uh, reading or uh, doing some breathing exercises, for example, some stretching exercises, something that can really make you feel relaxed at night before going to bed is, uh, is, is good. And for example, it's not recommended to watch TV right before going to bed because 
television actually is a, is a sending you some light that can st activate your brain plus the content of what you're going to watch it can be stimulating or could be not relaxing <laughs> so really avoiding this type of um, activities can be helpful as well so now what is the cognitive approach of the cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia what it means is that when you uh, are having sleep problems often people have some thoughts that can be actually uh, uh, non can that, that can be um, detrimental to their sleep. And that's common, for example, that I was saying earlier that people think that they need those really eight hours of sleep. And if they don't get them, they would they need to take a nap or go to bed earlier to make up for the lack of sleep. This is actually a lack of, this is actually a misconception because as I was saying earlier, not everyone needs eight hours of sleep. It really depends on, on each person. Some people may need less. And when you take a nap or when you go to bed earlier, it just decreases the sleep drive and you do not actually uh, help your brain to fall asleep easier at night. Uh, other um, uh, dysfunction beliefs is the fact to think that insomnia is, is to sort of exaggerate the potential consequences of insomnia. I think that insomnia can lead to many problems, but sometimes people would think that because they've won that night, this will affect their whole activities during the week, or they have to cancel the activities because they feel too tired, uh, and or, be, or they think that they won't be able to do anything during the day. Uh, so uh, I'm saying I'm saying this is dysfunctional because sometimes people would actually tend to uh, because they feel tired, they would tend to be uh, even more sedentary, uh, and this is actually something that may. Uh, worsen insomnia over time if you become even less active with time. So something that you need to do that will need to be done, and that's what the therapist would do with uh, uh, the person, is to see to re to reappraise those beliefs, to correct them, to explain them, to explain what is the what are the expectations that one should have about their sleep according to their age, and also to correct some of those dysfunction beliefs and to also sort of decatastrophize some of the thoughts that were that some people may have about the consequences of their bad sleep. So this is for the cognitive therapy. Now for the uh, behavioral aspect of the therapy, uh, this basically aims at sort of breaking the association between sleep environment and the hyperactivity that your brain sometimes has when they try to fall asleep. So one important uh, instance, for example, recommend people to only go to bed when they feel sleepy. And distinguishing between feeling asleep and feeling tired is important. That when you're insomniac, you often feel tired, but you don't often feel sleepy. And when at night, uh, if you're not able to fall asleep because you're not sleepy, then the recommendation is to get out of the bed and get out of the room and do some other things. Like could be reading, could be, you know, uh, stretching or doing other activities that are not stimulating, but that would be feeling real, that you could feel relaxed and going to bed after when you feel um, sleepy again. So, so this is really aiming at breaking the association between the bed environment and the hyper arousal that people we, we, we feel sometimes when they are having insomnia. And finally, one of the yeah, the last strategies people uh, learn is actually very important. It's called sleep restriction or sleep consolidation. This is basically to adjust your sleep schedules to in such a way uh, that your sleep pressure will be maximized. So, for example, if you take this uh, person in this example, this is a person that over a week uh, goes to bed on average. Uh, I spend an average time in bed of uh, eight hours. So for example, this person goes to bed at 10 and wake up at 6 a.m. But they believe that they sleep only on average um, about five hours and a half across the week. So it means that uh, two hours and a half, the person would be awake in bed. So in that case, what is recommended is actually to adjust the sleep schedule to the amount of time that you feel that you sleep plus 30 minutes. So instead of spending eight hours in bed, you would uh, recommend this person to only spend six hours in bed uh, because they feel that they sleep only five hours and a half. And basically, usually that would be with uh, delaying this, the, the time uh, 
that they go to bed to uh, a bit later. So in this case, if this person goes to bed at 10 p.m., let's try to have her or him go to bed at midnight and still wake up at 6 a.m. So what it will do is that you will decrease your time spent in bed and it doesn't mean that you will necessarily extend your sleep time automatically, but you will increase what is called sleep efficiency, which is the ratio of sleep of, of time spent in sleep over time spent in bed. And this is important because you want people to spend most of the time they're in bed asleep. And so by reducing the time in bed, you're increasing basically the time, the ratio of uh, what is called sleep efficiency. And this also creates what we call uh, a sleep pressure, a sleep drive, because people will be some, somewhat sleep restricted and they would feel more sleep pressure during the day. And this may help actually sleep better and for long amount of times over the following nights. And by doing this strategy, what we do is once a person is able to sleep uh, more deeper or longer uh, out of this period of, of, of sleep time, then you can expand the sleep window, the time they spend in bed, by 30 minutes uh, and, and another 30 minutes uh, up, to, uh, up to reaching the, uh, an amount of, of sleep time that is considered optimal for the person. So that's a strategy that's often uh, very useful. Now, as I was saying, CBT is often uh, the traditional a way to accessibility with a psychologist, a face-to-face, -face. but this presents some challenges because there's not many psychologists that, that have the qualifications uh, to do CBT or, or not many health professionals either. And usually most of them would be uh, in the private sector. So you'd have, you'd have to pay uh, some significant costs. Uh, and so also some people would not feel very comfortable or able to travel for uh, so many sessions uh, to see a health professional for their sleep. So basically, there's a there's different barriers and challenges for CBTI. And what we know now, and what has been developed over the past couple of years, is that it is possible to translate most of the strategies that could that would be discussed with therapists to an online format where you'd have a platform where you could learn the strategies by yourself by logging into a platform and an application and, and, and learning the modules by yourself. So that's something possible and that has been shown to produce some effects, some positive effects. Um, and this is why, for example, in our, in, you know, in our research center, in our lab, we developed a platform called eSpace is suite for the promotion of healthy aging in the community, which uh, is a web platform to disseminate uh, different interventions that aims at supporting the physical and cognitive health of older adults. So this is a platform that is accessible online on any uh, web uh, browser. Uh, so on your computer, on your iPad, even on your iPhone or on your smartphone and so basically once you log in uh, you are able to access different modules and now it's basically available so in english it's even in english and french so if you're interested in improving your diet uh, there's a nutrition module if you need if you're more interested in in boosting your memory there's a memory module but if you're interested in, in taking care of your sleep there's a sleep module here. And the CIM modules includes a variety, uh, all the CBTI modules I've discussed, but that would be explained in a sort of a interactive format with some visual content and also some audio content as a voiceover that explain to you uh, the different aspects of what is normal sleep, what is insomnia, what can you do. So you see here the explanation about the stimulus control, uh, the sleep hygiene, and there are some quiz at the end of each module to test, uh, make sure that you've learned uh, what you're supposed to learn correctly. And you can always go back to review the content. So now we're in the process of evaluating the effectiveness of this intervention uh, using, that's the ECOSMOS trial, where we want to see whether uh, by uh, accessing this platform, you can also improve not only your sleep, but also your brain health and your memory. Uh, and this is just the study that we're currently conducting. Uh, where we have people actually completing a variety of screening procedures, a baseline, 
They also have the opportunity to do some memory tests and to do also some MRI baseline. And then receive the therapy or control intervention through that platform. And after 10 weeks, we do the retest. And, uh, and also 20 weeks after, we do another retest to see what, are the, what is the impact. So um, I want to uh, emphasize this because we right now we are looking for participants. So if some of you or some people in your uh, networks are interested uh, to receive CBTI using this approach, this online approach, uh, they can contact us uh, with the uh, contact information here below. So this is for people who are aged 60 years and older with insomnia problems, report having some uh, some subjective decline in their memory. They think that uh, with, if you think that your, uh, your cognitive functions are less uh, performing than before, you need to live in Quebec, Ontario, and you need to be able to use a smartphone, tablet, or computer and have access to an internet connection home to be able to participate to this project. So uh, that concludes my uh, presentation. Uh, so if you have any more questions, please feel free to contact me here. And there's also, you can also visit the website of the lab, uh, also visit some other resources, for example, from the Canadian Sleep Society or the Fondation Sommeil, uh, which is an association for patients with sleep disorders. And uh, I think that's it. And I'm happy now to uh, uh, to answer any questions you may have.